Kentucky and potted a little throughout my life, but not recently. And I just came up on Shirley Bowers. I'm just glad to be here, and I have not potted actually for the last few years, so I hope some my bad habits can be uh, eliminated as I start out again. just tasting something, but improving skills and getting excited about new attitudes. And I think we must give that a sufficient concentration, if you see what I mean. Because in a place like this, although one is encouraged to go to other workshops and see people, if you're not disciplined about it, it will interrupt you know, your own experience in the particular thing you come to have. So if you can just watch that, you know, use it with discretion. I don't know, I think we better divide. Uh, those who would like to work with Elma, that's on stone there, to start with, and just get your clay ready and your wheels ready for stoneware, and those who would like to work with me on porcelain and do the equivalent thing, I think we just divide up, do we? That's better. Well, either that, or why don't I suggest that, you know, you go ahead and say demonstrate for a little while right. so that everyone can just sort of see how you move around the wheel and right. it, say for an hour or so, would that be at fine? And, you know, maybe... Yeah. I suggest that before we do that, and I've got to do it for myself, yeah. I've got to get my wheel right, my clay needed up, my tools right, and so on. I won't be quite ready for it. Right. You could be doing that for yourself now, getting your clay, getting your tools, getting your wheel right, and then when I'm ready, I'll give a shot and gather around folks and go on like that. Let's do that. And then say, that will probably put us right at around lunchtime. And then after lunch, uh, Dave and I need to work on the firing schedule. Then we can come back and the, the group can sort of divide up as to how they're going to work. But I think it'd be real. I think it'd be a real good start if everybody watched the master for a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I think it'd break the ice. The right foot is easier. Wedging. I think with that one. Well, yeah. We can spend a little bit of time on that. When you're wedging, you want to make sure you're doing the right thing. Make sure. You're trying to make it hard and soft, and you're trying to drive out the air. I've seen people wedging and wedging, putting more air in than taking it up. Yeah. All right. What are we? Yes. Is there a general schedule that they follow? such as first thing in the morning will be a demonstration period, or after lunch will be a demonstration period. When do we really need and want to be here? Or do, is it just going to be a schedule? Well, I, I think that the, as the schedule is set up for talking to Doug, you know, we're, we're going to start about 9 in the morning. And I would, if I would you know, just venture to guess at this point, that we'll probably start with some demonstrations. And then everyone to their wheel and work, and then we'll be going around and trying to assist. At least that's the way I, I sort of envision it happening. And then if you have questions and want to see things demonstrated, you know, we might sit down at your wheel and demonstrate something for you. And a, as it grows and develops, there, you know, might, there may be, you know, at times, general demonstration period. But I don't think that I can say that every day at 10 o'clock exactly I'm going to sit down and demonstrate and, and I don't presume to speak for David, but I think it's uh, generally, you know, if, we, if we, everybody gets here at 9 o'clock, we can sort of lay out the day possibly then and get, get started in, you know. I would make 
You get into little corners and places wow. when you're fettling and cleaning up.
We have a plug here. They are there. I'll get the one. Yeah. 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 needed and it's got an air bubble in. Uh, it's one cricket. Squeeze it up the air. Not again. Do you mind if we ask you questions while you're throwing? As long as I hear them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Shut the head off. All right. <laughs> Now, I'm not explaining anything at the moment, because one of the things you will find about porcelain, and I ought to explain this, is that it, it's water thirsty, much more than, than stoneware. Stoneware, often as not, is 80 odd percent ball play, with say 20 percent blob or something else. In other words, the plastic content in stoneware, the natural plastic content, is far higher than it is this, which has 50% or something like 50% of non-plastic material in of the quartz, the feldspar, they're not plastic. And that means that in this plastic state, I know you don't talk about plastic, uh, porosity very much in the plastic state, but it has a porosity, it takes up water, you know, on the surface much more readily done than stoneware. That means that if I go on too long without dipping my hand in the water, it will suddenly go dry on the surface and it will sort of drag to the pot. Now, with stoneware, you can afford a certain amount of uh, eccentricity and so on. With porcelain, you can't, especially if you're throwing porcelain thin. If I get this distorted in the throwing process, and I turn it upside down later on for turning the foot, I will turn it, and I will turn it thinner on one side than the other, so it's never quite with temper. Now, in the further drying, that will register as a warp, and in the further firing, it will register as a further warp. You can see the importance, therefore, of not having a dry hand. And if I use that, especially that tapered edge, you see, onto the clay. The clay never gets uh, really dry because it's being fed with water on the surface. 
it's particularly important to me because I'm a person who makes fairly thin translucent bowls. Therefore, the distortion factor is that much greater. I do most of my throwing at home on a kick wheel because I find the pedal is uh, sometimes a little difficult to manipulate. It can all too easily go down too far. It's not like the accelerator of the car, you know, you push the pedal down too far and it hops forward. The ball doesn't shoot forward, it shoots up. <laughs> Now, so far, the clay is quite nice to throw with. It's the right hardness. And you will be surprised how hard I use the clay. And again, there's a reason for it. If one's working, say, five minutes or something like that on a bowl, and I've told you that it's water thirsty, if you don't start with it fairly hard, by the time you're getting near the end of the bowl, when it's getting really thinned out and perhaps rather wide, it's getting soft. You know, and it's going to sit on you. Or when you try to lift it off the wheel, it's going to buckle. So start with it much harder than normal to allow for that. This bowl will be turned, and it has a thickness in the foot that's probably half to three quarters of an inch. We'll see. Wow. That much clay. It's a lot. Now, I leave it with that much clay because I want to make a fairly deep foot. You know, part of the concept of the bowl is to have a fairly deep foot. very thin, but because it's got a deep foot, I can lift it off without having to throw it on a bat. strand wire, you separate the clay you're lifting off from what is left on the wheel head effectively. If you use a thin single strand, you cut it once, you cut it twice, you start with it thin, it just won't cut. So, there's a great point in using one of these, this is a lay straight type wire. It's thick at the bottom, you saw how thick. not distorted at all. If I jag my hand, it will be. Now, do ask questions, you know, if they arise in your mind as I'm working. David, can you talk about how that form evolved? Um, well, it's the simplest of forms. Uh, I think it's difficult to answer because it, it is rather 
basic. Um, but on the other hand, if we relate to some of the Chinese bowls, the Sung Dynasty it was engraved and had the uh, Celadon glazes on, and you can see them in all the museums. And when it's turned, it'll have a much smaller foot, because the foot will be deeper, it will lift the bowl up off the table because of it. And of course, it's got this flared out rim. Um, I've made this kind of bowl with variations over the years. Um, uh, I, by the way, I ought just to mention that although I'm by training and background a functional potter, you know, I've spent a great deal of my, my life doing production work in the earlier years, and I don't do it very much now. So in a way, my forms, many of them have derived from functional usages in the first place. But that doesn't necessarily hold good now. I may, I may term that bowl eventually to have so small a foot that function, ordinary function, use on the table, is ruled up. And it has changed from being a functional object to an object that has a visual appeal and is, in a sense, you see, moving from pure function into a kind of sculptural area or form. Um, and I have to confess that, you know, that sold at perhaps quite a high price. Nobody's going to use them. They're going to put them somewhere to look at. Hopefully that the decoration that I do afterwards and the quality of the glaze and everything will enhance the whole, and it will be a thing to look at. Although it could, you know, I mean, if you want to make a flower arrangement in it and you put a little holder in it and you made a certain flower arrangement, you could still have it operating for that kind of function. That kind of function doesn't demand a foot ring as wide as one you're going to eat your cornflakes out of. <laughs> so, but it's interesting how one moves from a sort of functional basis in the first place. And most parts, you know, have served as functions of one sort or another in the first instance. But they move, especially in this day and age when nearly all the concepts about form and individual work and selling in galleries at high prices have taken the place of the ordinary marketplace. And I think all of us have to make up our minds, you know, where we belong. Terry is saying, where is he? I don't know. Terry is saying, you know, he wants to have some experience in getting really fluent on functional repetitive work. That's fine. That's his target for the moment. You come to Terry in three or four years' time, he may change that target. He's been doing it working in for a different market, a different concept. We all change. And we all grow. That's important. <laughs> we grow in our faith. Anyway, I wasn't going on too many theories, but um, I don't know, it's half an answer to your question, really. Speaking of growing, how do you keep it from growing out from the bottom? And keep See, the, you know, when you're right, 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 right. Well, back at the very beginning part of the throwing, When you put your hand on it, make sure that this part is being kept close in and is not allowing the clay to do this. It's very unsatisfactory when you're throwing a shape and you've got all that clay spread out. So right from the beginning, have a sharp definition between the wheel head and the clay. And sometimes run your finger down the side like that to keep that definition. Now, some of you are right at the beginning on, and probably have problems with centering. Who does? Anybody here not satisfied they've got over the problem of centering? Might hope. I don't know. <laughs> See, that's right at the beginning of the elementary stage of throwing. The first thing you've got to do with any lump of clay is to get it in the middle. And I have a, a way of teaching, which is part of the <laughs> Chinese torture system. <laughs> now, See, look, if the clay is like that, your hand is going up and down like that. I stand at the hard task oh. and with a needle in it. <laughs> That'll teach you to get it in the middle quickly. <laughs> now, you know when it's in the middle because your hands are dead still. And this is revolving just as if it was the spindle or axle of a dynamo. You don't see it moving, no eccentricity. And you've got to, you've got to, that wants lots of practice, 
try over and over again. I'm just going to make a series of little goals for the moment, because I want to do different decorative treatments later on. I want some to be fluted, some to be painted, some to have wax resist. Various ways of treating. One of the points that you, those beginners of you who haven't done much on the wheel, usually the speed of revolution is fastest when you're centering. And as it gets towards the end and the thing gets wider and wider and thinner and thinner, you slow and slower. potential decoration for this bowl is not the same as I have for the one I just made. Okay. Um, but there's a certain amount of flexibility there. It's not absolutely rigid, you know. And I might change my idea when it comes to decoration. You know, I may have an idea for it now, but when it comes to it, you know, I might just do something a little bit different. You have actually an image of the bowl already? Are finished. You have the image of the bowl. No. Yes, so I, I, no. Um, one of the things that people tend to forget about throwing, I think, is that it isn't quite as rigid as you might think. I mean, if you're right, if you're making a hundred mugs and they're going to hold half a pint of liquid, and they require ten ounces to make them, they're four inches high and they're three inches across. Well, you're pretty restricted. You know, from there, you know, you're restricted, and you will make those um, fairly automatically. You make the first one carefully, and you say, well, that's it. I want them all like that. Yes. And you will go ahead, and you will make them, and you're not employing further imaginative, um, creative thoughts, really. From then on, you've done your, it's pre-designed from then on, and from then on, it's sheer skill to adhere to the thing you've set yourself up as being the one you like best. You perhaps make two or three at first, and they're not very satisfactory except one. And that's the one you're going to follow. Now, that sounds pretty rigid. You see, it is. And um, I think, really, in teaching the, the making of that kind of shape, you have to be, whether it's for yourself or for the student you're teaching or the employee that you have that you're going to pay a wage to, you know, and he, he's got to make enough living and you've got to sell enough and it's all got to be the same and the shops mustn't come back and say, look, the last batch wasn't as good as the previous one, the shapes were different and this kind of thing. 
Um, so I think when you're making for that kind of thing, you have to take that. Take, take it out clearly for yourself, you know. Because I know there are a lot of people say, ah, yes, there are a hundred there, but you know, every one is an individual. 